Hi again. I know many of you will have seen our recent video on Edmund Gruss's book, We Left Jehovah's Witnesses, and we indicated in that video that we would look at at least one of the bios in, in this book of testimonies of couples who left the Watchtower. Look at the bio of William and Joan Setnar, who were workers at headquarters back in the 1950s. So we have some personal history with the Setnars. Uh, we benefited greatly from their ministry that was already going in the 70s and 80s, and by the time we left in 1988, we found out they were running conventions for ex-witnesses down in Pennsylvania. Many have benefited by those conventions, not just by the ministry of the Setnars. Bill was still alive in those days. But also by uh, the contributions of others who contributed to that, that uh, very nice fellowship that developed from the ministry of the Setnars in those decades and included people like uh, David Reed and Dwayne McNanny. And in, in our experience with them, they were so warm and so hospitable that you couldn't help but love them and realize that everything they were saying was absolutely and undoubtedly true. And I hadn't read this book at that time, but I thought to pass along their testimony, their own words from this book. It takes up about 40 pages of this book, a third of the whole book, a quarter of the whole book, really. And I can't help but think of, of their the way they've blessed so many thousands of ex-witnesses over the decades, and are quite, to, to too many ex-witnesses now, are quite unknown. Joan, I understand, just died a few months ago, so this is a good time to reflect upon the, the blessing that they were to so many people. Here's their testimony anyway from why, rather, we left Jehovah's Witnesses, a nonprofit organization. This is this intro is written by Bill Setnar. The title of this chapter is An Inside View of the Watchtower Society. The August 7th, 1964 issue of the Register of Orange County, California carried an article that headlined, quote, Dad Aids in Ban of Jehovah's Witness, unquote. The story by Bill Farr reported on the recent disfellowshipping of my wife and my earlier similar experience in December 1962. My heresy was questioning the witness's ban on blood transfusion. My wife's was apostasy. She had attended one of my talks on the witnesses. My real break from the Jehovah's Witnesses, however, was not the result of being disfellowshipped, but rather the effect of arriving at the answer to what I considered the most important question of life. Was the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society the governing body of the Jehovah's Witnesses, God's organization? My experiences and investigations while working at the headquarters of this society and afterward in the local kingdom hall convinced me that its claim to God's election or selection was baseless presumption. Further examination has strengthened this conviction. My story and that of my wife Joan presents our search for truth, our dedication to what we believe to be true, our subsequent disillusionment and our discovery through God's leading of peace, not in an organization, but in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And then Bill takes up the story of his early biography. He says, I was born in Ambridge, Pennsylvania, a few months before the stock market crash of 1929. My parents were Catholic, and as a young man, Dad had even considered becoming a priest. About the time of my birth, my, my mother became disillusioned with Catholicism because of the questionable behavior of the local priest. She seriously questioned whether the Catholic Church was really God's representative on earth. This disenchantment produced a vacuum which prepared the way for the visits of Jehovah's Witnesses and the acceptance of their teachings. My mother became convinced that Catholic doctrines were wrong, and she tried to get my dad to attend witness meetings with her, but he refused. In fact, he said, we're getting out of one mess and going into another, but it wasn't long before my father also became interested in the witnesses because one of his school friends was one. My first recollections about the Watch Star Society are of the Washington, D.C. Convention in 1935. Judge Rutherford was mentioned as the president of God's theocratic organization on Earth. I was led to understand that whatever came from the society was not to be questioned, 
but it was God's channel for all Bible understanding. In 1937, after two years of attending meetings three times a week and studying the book, The Harp of God, I prayed a sincere and fervent prayer. Father, whatever you want me to do, I dedicate my life to your service. At the convention in Columbus, Ohio that year, when Judge Rutherford appeared, I broke away from my folks, ran under the usher's canes, and grabbed his coat. What a thrill! In my young mind, his image was so glorified. He was the greatest fighter for Jehovah God and Jesus Christ that the world had ever seen. Whatever the judge said was true. In the footnote to that, he says, I found out after leaving the society that Rutherford's title of judge was based upon his acting as a stand-in for the regular judge when he was ill, which amounted to about four days of service. He was never elected or appointed to a judgeship. And then Sentner goes on, it was in the same year that I witnessed the persecution of Jehovah's Witnesses. They were manhandled and some of their cars were overturned. I saw a sign ripped off my father's car. This treatment caused some witnesses to leave the movement, but the ones who remained became more fervent and united in the work. Soon after this, my parents were arrested and put in jail in Monison, Pennsylvania, for carrying signs which declared religion is a snare and a racket. Later I realized that my parents were not persecuted for righteousness sake, as we believed at the time. If their signs had stated false religion is a snare and a racket, they would not have been persecuted. I still remember shoving bananas through the prison bars to my folks and others in the jail. My parents were released after several days. In 1940, I was baptized at the Detroit Convention. Baptism was an outward sign of my dedication to Jehovah. In 1943, as a junior high school student, I became a summer pioneer, putting in 150 hours a month in the service. I did this for four years. Although I was only 13 years of age, I was appointed advertising servant, which meant that I was in charge of the magazines, sound equipment, and phonographs. I set up the sound system for our park programs and played music before and after the meetings. I was given this responsibility because my dedication was recognized. I was very serious concerning my life as a Jehovah's Witness. When the Theocratic Ministry School was begun, I enrolled, and I remember giving my first talk on the name Jehovah. I did not know then that Jehovah was an erroneous or false reading. In my house-to-house -house calling, I was very rarely challenged on my beliefs. I felt so confident that what I had been taught was true that I actually welcomed opposition. Occasionally a person would ask me if I had been born again. I replied, yes, and thought to myself, now let's talk about something important. The expression had little meaning to me. By 1947, two questions had become a real concern. Was it wrong to serve in the armed forces? or armed services, was the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society God's organization? The second question was the most important. I knew many non-witness individuals whom I respected for their abilities, their knowledge of the Bible, their intelligence, and obvious love of God. I wondered why God chose only the society as his organization and would destroy all other groups and individuals. What made the Watchtower leaders different? I wanted to see this for myself. I reasoned that if I went to Bethel and worked there, I could actually sit down and talk with these leaders. The question of serving in the armed forces would also be taken care of, for I would have a 4D classification. I had tried to get into Bethel as early as 1943 by sending letters to headquarters. I continued writing for several years. The replies from the president's office stated that I should wait at least until I finished high school. One of the requirements at Bethel was that a person could not get married while serving there. It was nothing for me to, pr pr to promise this in expectation of serving in the headquarters of God's visible organization. In 1947, at the age of 18, I went into full-time pioneer service. My first assignment was in Beverly Hills, California, where I met Jack Benny and other celebrities. I started some Bible studies with some well-known people. Then I was asked by the Society to go to Pacific Grove, California, to pioneer there. From there, in the spring of 1950, I was invited to go to work at Bethel. 
My first assignment in, at Watchtower headquarters was as a, right, a waiter, and after six weeks I was transferred to the circulation department of the offices at 117 Adams Street. About six months later, I was asked to work in the service department under T.J. Sullivan, who later, by the way, became a governing body member. I should say he was act actually acting on the governing body, such as it was in those days. He was uh, on the, uh, the board. What a privilege, I thought. Among other things, this department organized congregations, approved circuit assemblies, and appointed servants. It also handled problems and answered Bible questions submitted by the congregations and acted as a court of appeals in disfellowshipping cases. My area of responsibility was one-third of the United States, from the Mason-Dixon line south and over to Texas. Often replies involve no more than sending out individually typed form letters or, or referring people to the appropriate Watchtower publications for society policy. If a letter came to my desk which I could not answer, I consulted with T.J. Sullivan. Sometimes he would check with Vice President Fred Franz or President Nathan Knorr. Franz usually answered matters of biblical policy and Knorr dealt with organizational matters. We'll continue because this is, as I said before, about 40 pages of material. Uh, next time he's getting into vaccination is a direct violation of the law of Jehovah God and how God changed his mind on that one in the 1950s. I'll put in a link to a, a, a video, a meditation really by Ray Franz upon how it was Nathan Knorr who built the modern organization as a religious slash business empire. Ironically, right after, of course, this campaign that uh, Bill Setnar refers to here, this religion is a snare and a racket, which was the the mantra of those who followed J.F. Rutherford in the late 1930s. So is, Ray Franz is meditating upon the question, is therefore this business empire that Nathan Knorr built also a snare and a racket? So next time, vaccinations and a God who changes his mind, plus Nathan Knorr's Cadillac. <laughs>